What's up, guys? Welcome back to Tidal Gardens. If you are new here, Tidal Gardens is a coral farm located in Copley, Ohio. And on this channel, we talk about all things reef aquarium related. So this video is all about corals that I wish we could be farming here. But for one reason or another, they simply don't make great candidates for aquaculture. People often ask, is everything on Tidal Gardens aquacultured? And unfortunately, that's simply not the case. We try to farm as much stuff as possible. So a lot of the small polyp stony corals are pretty easy to propagate, even some of the faster growing large polyp stonies. Some things though just do not work on an industrial scale. Certain things wonderful for a home aquarium sized project, but once you start talking about thousands of gallons, um, the scale up just isn't there. So anyway, these are my top five corals that I wish we could be farming. Let's start with number five. The fifth coral on this list are large leathers. Mainly I was thinking about toadstool leathers, but it can kind of translate to pretty much any of the other ones, like the, the nephthias, the lobophytums, but what I had in mind were sarcophyton toadstool leathers. Now, you probably are wondering, especially for the folks that have been in this hobby for a little while, you can totally propagate these leathers, and it is true. However, there is a speed to aquaculture that is kind of sabotaging these efforts. My issue, with a lot of these large leather corals is that it's kind of difficult to secure them onto a substrate. That's probably the biggest problem because they're escape artists. It's fairly easy to cut around their rim. Then you have this kind of this C-shaped thing and you, you can trim around that C-shape to get these little one inch little chicken nugget guys. But securing that little chicken nugget of a leather down to something and actually having it stay. It's a bit of a pain in the butt, let's just say. The other thing is, these leathers, I think people overinflate how fast they grow because they are a very large growing coral. People will have one in their tank and they never cut it, so it just gets massive and huge. And I think that gets people to this misconception that they're a very fast growing coral. But once you start being in the business of selling them, is when you realize that there's a lot of stuff that grows faster than big leathers. Leathers are in weirdly high demand, especially some of like the more highly sought after, like the bright green ones, like the Japanese deep water ones, all that stuff, right? They get cleared out very quickly. So those two things I would say, it's the speed of their growth as well as their difficulty in getting them to attach to a substrate or what makes the big leather corals kind of problematic for aquaculture. Yes, we do propagate them, but there's a lot of room for improvement. Okay, moving on. The number four coral on this list used to be one of my all-time favorite corals. This was the coral, I would say, that got me hooked into this hobby 30-something odd years ago, and that is the Elegance Coral. The Elegance is a large polyp stony coral. I've loved them ever since I've seen them because they have this anemone-like aesthetic but being a stony coral, they don't scoot around your whole tank like an anemone and just sting everything in sight. Also, my favorite ones have like this iridescent quality to their body, and the rare ones have bright yellow tips, which is absolutely stunning. They can kind of either grow from like a kind of a cone-shaped base or a wall shape, which kind of goes something like that. Now, People do cut the skeleton of an elegance coral, but this is a fairly slow growing coral as far as how fast it lays down new skeleton. So it's really common to have like this little tiny nublet of skeleton and a giant fleshy body of an elegance coming off of it. I think for long-term aquaculture, you really do need corals that are able to deposit more skeleton than an elegance typically does. Also, the very act of cutting an elegance, it is a pretty big risk. Um, 
there's there's certain corals that just heal super easily and super well from cutting, and elegances are a bit of a coin flip. If you have a very expensive, rare, yellow-tipped elegance, and you want to have now two of them, you're taking a little bit of a risk making that cut. There's a chance that one of those two might not survive. There's a chance that both pieces after that cutting will not survive. And they're really prone to bailout once that happens. If you don't know what I'm talking about, polyp bailout is a thing that elegances can do from time to time as this last ditch effort to save itself. And usually when that happens, it doesn't save itself. It'll pop right off of the skeleton, it'll lay down somewhere, maybe it'll stay open for a little while. But more often than not, they don't make it. So if you want to learn more about that topic, we've done a video on that, and I will link that video in, in the description below. So that's number four, the elegance coral. The number three coral on this list, kind of similar to elegances, but they are euphilia in general. And in, in common terms, euphilia translates to hammers, torches, and frog spawn, but really euphilia is a genus of corals, and there are a lot of these tweeners, right? You might have seen something that kind of looks like a hammer, but the hammer tips are super tiny to the point where they almost look like torch tips, but they're not quite torched. So there's a lot of these little things. Sometimes there's like a hybrid between a hammer and a frog spawn, and some people call those frammers. Really, those are common names. The real names are Euphilia something, Euphilia Ancora, Euphilia Devisa, something else, right? Don't get too caught up in, is this a frog spawn? Is this a torch? Don't worry about it. They're all Euphilia. Anyway, taxonomy aside, why do they not work out quite so well for propagation? Certain ones will grow great in a home aquarium. They will bud off many more heads. You, so you don't have that cutting risk like you do with elegances. Now, the issue is for long-term aquaculture of these guys. What I've seen is, even despite that, the fact that they do grow fast enough, maybe, that's even borderline. They're, they're not the fastest growing thing in the world for aquaculture, but they're okay. Let's just say, for the sake of argument, that's not the biggest issue. Kind of a big issue, though, is that they're susceptible to weird bacterial diseases every now and again. And it, maybe it'll just affect one colony, maybe it'll affect an entire section of an aquarium, but there's numerous types of diseases that will suddenly strike one of these things and just overnight you will just lose heads. So what was probably like three, four months of like good solid growth that you're just waiting for to be able to offer to your customer base and it's like, well, that's all gone now. If you look at it that way and kind of incorporate that into your growth model, not so good, not so good. So yeah, the coral's growing fast enough, but it's not surviving well enough. And it's, it's so difficult to pin down why some of those uh, bacterial issues pop up. Like maybe it took some damage at some point, maybe it's not getting some sort of nutritional thing, but it is a big mystery and it happens enough to enough people that, that it might not just be a tidal garden specific problem, but hopefully that is a problem that can be overcome because it's not anything intrinsically in the coral itself that prevents it from, for example, just it's simply not growing fast enough. If you didn't know, there's a, several different growth forms of euphilia. One of the forms is a wall kind of similar to uh, an elegance. And those can be cut just like elegances, but they run into the same problem that elegances do. Uh, there's issues of survivability, and there's issues of the growth rates of wall-based corals. The better kind for long-term propagation, I would say, are the ones that bud. And those tend to be Indonesian and are by far the fastest growing. There is a third type, I would say, that it is the, it's the branching Australian varieties. The branching Australian varieties of euphilia tend to, um, I guess it's called longitudinal fission. It's where if you start with like a single head like this, it'll pinch off into like a figure eight and eventually separate out into two heads. They grow extremely slowly. So at least there's one that could potentially grow fast enough for commercial aquaculture. 
So that is the number three coral on the list. It's Euphilia, the entire genus. The number two coral on this list is one of my favorite, let's call them like Bentley class large polyps stony corals, and that is Acanthophilia. Acanthophilia are called meat corals or donut corals sometimes. They occupy a rare price tier of this hobby, let's just say. You have to really, really be into your collector stuff to have a budget for these things. The Acanthophilia with top end coloration, easily four figures, the craziest ones. Do a quick search, you guys, for rainbow Acanthophilia and see what comes back. And I guarantee you, whoever bought that coral paid five figures for it. It's, they're in that tier. I think you would have to be a total madman to run one of these things through a saw. That is an insane risk that I don't know too many people that would have ever even, ever tried something like that. I, it, that's not going to ever happen here. <laughs> Tidal Gardens will not be running an acanthophilia through a saw. Not even that curious. I think that for corals like Acanthophilia, the answer to this problem might be some sort of sexual reproduction. When I visited the UK last fall, I spoke to Jamie Craggs over there, and he's doing a lot of stuff with sexual reproduction of Acropora and small polyp stony corals. When I asked him a little bit when it came to like the large polyp stony stuff, he was saying that a, he doesn't have a lot of experience with it, but B, it's significantly different than the Acroporas because in the Acropora ones, the egg and the sperm, they interact out in the ocean, whereas uh, I believe that the large polyp stonies have internal fertilization. So the eggs that are produced inside of one of these large polyp stony corals are already fertilized, which theoretically, I guess, is a big benefit. At the same time, something that's problematic about an acanthophilia would probably be its slow growth rate. Assuming that you could do the whole sperm and egg thing with acanthophilia, how long would it take for you to get from some little spawn to a sellable size, let's say three, four inch uh, full-size colony? That could be a little while, but if you're talking about the crazy rainbow stuff selling for four to five figures, it might be worth it. It'll be interesting to see in the coming years what kind of progress is made on that front, if that's ever going to be a thing. That is the number two coral on this list, Acanthophilia. The number one coral on this list is Scolemia. Very similar issue with Acanthophilia. Now, Unlike acanthophilia, I have seen people cut scolies. And by the way, technically, scolies are reclassified as homophilia right now. But for the most part, the entire industry still refers to them as scolies. That's probably what you're familiar with. That's what I'm talking about. Anyway, I have seen people cut scolies. I don't know if that's the answer, simply because you still have that risk issue that you're having with a lot of these other corals, right? There isn't a guarantee that they're going to survive. And with some of the higher priced scolies, like the master scolies, some of like the really intensely colored ultras, things like that, it's a bit more of a risk than I think a lot of coral farms are looking to do. The other issue with cutting a scoli is you're going to get an odd shaped piece, right? Imagine like you're cutting a pie, you're gonna kinda, you're gonna get pie-shaped pieces. That's a particular problem with scolies as far as like the market is concerned because you may or may not believe this, but there is a big difference on the consumer end of things with a completely perfectly round scoli and a slightly oblong or kidney bean shaped colony. Big difference, big difference in price. If you're already starting off with a pie-shaped piece that now you have to not only hope survives, but then survives and then regrows into a perfect round thing, you're going to be running into a very long timetable. And oftentimes long timetables aren't going to make a whole lot of sense in commercial aquaculture, unfortunately. So similar to Acanthophilia, perhaps a solution to the scolemia puzzle is also going to be some sort of sexual reproduction. We'll see.
there's a common theme running through my list, and that is how slow it is to get some of these things going. We've talked about some possible solutions for every single one of them, but I think that there's one other way that you can kind of get around the, the growth rate issue, and that is just increasing the volume of the entire system, right? So if something is too slow, you know how you can double the speed? You double the size of your operation. So at some point, the coral farm is going to have to do the math on that and say, well, we could have these mega giant systems to house all of these euphilia and elegances and big leathers, all that stuff. But the business mind will then kick in and be like, well, we could make that same amount of money with one tenth of the space doing high-end acros or something like that. I have a feeling that the types of corals on this list, it's going to be like a multi-pronged solution that's going to have to come into place to make this work on large commercial scales. So that pretty much does it for my top five list. What do you guys think? Did I forget any of your corals that you would think that would make it onto this list? I can already tell that perhaps an honorable mention should go to Favia. Those tend to be super slow. At least they can be cut pretty readily, blah, blah, blah. At least it's multi-headed rather than like a, a single polyp. So there, there's a couple of good candidates out there. So in the comments below, by all means, let me know what you think. And if you guys have any like creative solutions for some of the aquaculture issues with these types of corals, also put it in the comments below. All right, guys, that does it from here. Happy reefing and happy aquaculturing. Bye, guys.